This woman stood smirking after trying to kill a police officer. Then a black judge made her instantly regret it. Desiree Brachet Smith stood in court in front of the judge. Her lips curled into a smirk. From the way she was smirking, you would think that it was Judge Judy's court and she was standing there for a parking ticket. Her nonchalant attitude would have looked funny to anyone who didn't know the seriousness of her charges, but to those who did, her smirk was nothing short of outraging. Judge Stephen Stokes, a stern and experienced black judge, observed Desiree with disapproval. This wasn't the first time he had seen such behavior in his courtroom, but there was something particularly unsettling about the way Desiree seemed not to be moved by her crime. She acted as if she were untouchable, despite the fact that she was standing trial because she had almost killed a cop. Judge Stokes looked at the court documents in front of him. The documents showed what had led to this moment in stark detail. It made the judge see how a day that had begun like any other for officers Glass and Wright ended in a way that neither of them would ever forget. It had been a typical evening in Fayetteville, North Carolina, a town known for its quiet streets. Officers Jeremy Glass and David Wright were on patrol, driving through the calm neighborhoods as part of their routine. The conversation between the two was a way to pass the time and take their minds off the stresses of their personal lives. Officer Wright, in particular, had a lot on his mind. His wife was expecting their first child, and the coming responsibility weighed heavily on him. The conversation about last night's game was a distraction to help him temporarily forget the anxiety that ate his insides. The streets were empty, apart from the occasional passing cars. The cops knew every corner of this town, and they were its protectors. But as they rounded a bend, their peaceful patrol was shattered by the roar of an engine. Out of nowhere, a Chevrolet Impala zoomed past them at a shocking speed. The two officers were so stunned that their conversation cut off mid-sentence as they watched the car whip around the corner. It was as if a ghost rider had passed them, there one moment, but gone the next, leaving nothing but a trail of smoke down the road. The Impala raced toward a stop sign at the end of the block, and the officers waited, hoping that it would stop, but it did not show even the slightest sign of slowing down. The situation had gone from unusual to dangerous in the blink of an eye, and both men knew they had to act fast. Officer Wright was driving, and he instinctively pressed down on the gas pedal. Glass was already moving to activate the lights and sirens. They had to get the driver before they hurt someone. The sirens wailed and the cops activated their lights to signal the driver to stop. But instead of slowing down, the Impala seemed to pick up even more speed. The chase was on and the cops began to chase after the driver. It was quickly becoming clear that this wasn't just a case of a driver in a hurry. This was something potentially far more dangerous. The cops weaved through the streets as they tried to keep up with the speeding car. Most of the roads were mostly empty, but every intersection they blew through was a potential accident waiting to happen. The driver of the Impala was completely out of control, and it was only a matter of time before something really bad happened. As the cops approached an intersection, Wright made a split-second decision to take a shortcut. He veered down a side street in hopes of cutting the Impala off. The maneuver was risky, but it paid off. When they emerged back onto the main road, they found themselves directly in front of the speeding car. With no time to think, Wright slammed on the brakes. He brought the patrol car to a screeching halt in the middle of the road, effectively blocking the Impala's path. The two vehicles were now face to face and the Impala had nowhere to go. Officer Wright was the first to move. He threw open the driver's side door and stepped out with his hand hovering near his holstered gun. He didn't draw it yet because there was a protocol to follow, even in situations as tense as this one. His training told him to approach cautiously and assess the situation before escalating it. But as he walked toward the Impala, Something told him that this was not going to be an ordinary traffic stop. The driver's window was rolled up, but through the front glass, Wright could see the outline of a figure in the driver's seat. He couldn't make out the details, but he could tell it was a woman. That alone was surprising. Most reckless drivers he had encountered in the past had been men. This was different, and the unpredictability of it made him uneasy. As Wright reached the window, he tapped on the glass with the back of his hand. The woman inside turned her head and slowly wound down the glass. As she did, she gave him a look that sent a chill down his spine. This was the first time Wright was seeing Desiree Brechet Smith. She was a young lady in her early 20s and she had a pretty, mixed-race face that might have been charming under different circumstances. But it wasn't Desiree's appearance that struck Wright. Instead, it was the expression on her face. She was smiling, but not the kind of smile that offered comfort or reassurance. It was a cold, cunning smirk that spoke of mischief and malice. It was the kind of smile that made Wright instinctively tighten his grip on his gun. Wright kept his voice steady as he asked the young lady if she knew how fast she was going. But the young woman didn't answer. She just kept smiling in a really creepy way. Wright felt the hair on the back of his neck stand on end. Something wasn't right. 
His instincts screamed at him to be careful and stay alert. Wright then instructed her to provide the license and registration of the car. Desiree nodded and she reached for the glove box. As she did, the cop's mind raced it with possibilities. Was she getting her registration or was it something else? Every fiber of his being told him to be ready for anything, but that was when Officer Wright made what would be the biggest mistake of his life. He looked away. Sergeant Glass was still in the patrol car blocking the young lady's car and he honked at Wright to ask him what was going on. For a split second, Wright glanced back at the patrol car and signaled for him to be on standby. That moment of distraction would be one he would later regret. When Wright turned back to the car, Desiree was pointing something at him. It wasn't her license and registration. It was a gun. Wright was shocked to his very core. There was no time to react or even any time to think. The woman aimed the weapon right at him and shot. As the sound of the shot rang out, Wright felt himself hit the ground. Glass watched in horror as his partner went down. Without thinking, he activated his emergency gear and grabbed his own weapon. He then threw open the car door to confront the shooter. But before he could even get out, the young lady had turned and she was firing at him too. The glass of the patrol car's windshield shattered as two bullets missed glass by inches. Glass threw himself to the ground as shards of glass rained down around him. But Desiree wasn't done yet. In one swift motion, she rolled up her window, slammed the Impala into gear and hit the gas. The car lunged forward as she aimed the vehicle directly at Glass, but Glass was faster. He managed to dive out of the way and rolled across the road as the Impala roared past him. The car smashed into the patrol car with a sickening crunch, sending metal and glass flying in all directions. When the dust settled, the Impala had disappeared, leaving destruction in its wake. Glass scrambled to his feet and he looked around quickly. His first thought was of right. Where was he? Was he okay? The last thing Glass had seen was his partner hitting the ground. He imagined the worst. What was meant to be a routine traffic stop had just turned into a nightmare. Glass spotted Wright. He was still lying in the same position he had been when the lady shot at him. The cop almost had a panic attack. Wright was about to be a dad. It would hurt him if he lost his friend just like that. He ran over to Wright and began to shake him, telling him to wake up. To his surprise, Wright sat up and began to look himself all over. He was dazed but alive. Wright reached up to touch his chest, half expecting to find a bullet wound, but there was nothing. The bullet had missed him entirely, and there was not even a single injury on him. He was in shock, as he struggled to comprehend how close he had come to being a slain cop. Glass was elated. Apparently, Wright was fast enough, and the shooter had terrible aim, but there was no time for jubilation. The woman was still out there, and she was no longer just a reckless driver. She was armed and dangerous, and they needed to catch her before she caused any more harm. Glass's mind raced as he considered their options. Their patrol car was wrecked. The engine was smoking and the front end was crumpled from when Desiree knocked it out of her way. They couldn't pursue her in that and backup was still minutes away. Every second counted and they couldn't afford to waste any of them. Just as Glass was about to radio for another unit, a shout caught his attention. He turned to see a man running toward them from a nearby diner. The middle-aged man and other patrons had witnessed the entire scene from the diner. The man ran toward the cops and held out a set of car keys. Here, take my car. Go get her. Officer Glass didn't hesitate. He gave the man a grateful nod and grabbed the keys from his outstretched hand. Wright followed closely behind as they made their way to the civilian's car. The vehicle was a sleek black sedan that sat idling outside the diner. It wasn't a patrol car, but it was the fastest car on that street. Let's get her, Glass said as he jumped into the driver's seat. Wright followed him and jumped into the passenger side. As the engine started, the cops knew that this was exactly what they needed to close the gap on Desiree Brochet. They had to catch her, but they also had to be careful as she had already proven she was willing to shoot cops. Wright pulled out his radio and relayed their situation to dispatch. He urgently requested backup and alerted other units of the chase. Attention all units, Wright radio. Suspect is a mixed race female, mid twenties, driving a stolen Chevrolet Impala. Suspect is armed and has fired shots at officers. Last seen heading northbound on Sycamore Street. Be advised, suspect is extremely dangerous. The response from dispatch was immediate and there was confirmation that backup was on the way. But Glass and Wright both knew that the closest units were still several minutes out. They were on their own for now. Wright was scanning the streets looking from side to side for any sign of the Impala. Then he finally saw it. There, he suddenly shouted, pointing ahead. His sharp eyes had caught a glimpse of the taillights disappearing around another bend. Glass increased his speed and soon he was close enough to the fleeing vehicle. The driver who had caused the chaos was just a 23-year-old college student with a clean record. 
Despite her reckless driving and attempt to flee the police, Desiree Brechet Smith seemed confident that she could outmaneuver the officers pursuing her. But she really underestimated the determination of Glass and Wright. When she saw the cops right behind her in a civilian vehicle, she was surprised. Yet she still had no intention of stopping. As the cops closed the distance, Wright could see the Impala more clearly. Desiree was driving like a maniac, swerving between lanes and narrowly avoiding parked cars. She was reckless, but also skilled. She knew how to handle a car at high speeds, and she was using every bit of that knowledge to try to shake them. But Glass was relentless. He matched her move for move and kept the sedan close on her tail. Yet Desiree showed no signs of slowing down. As they closed in on her, she reached out from the window and began firing at them from her vehicle. While Glass swerved to dodge the shots, he was also calculating the next move. The streets were starting to get more congested as they neared the downtown area, and the risk of a collision was growing with every passing second. He had to find a way to end this before someone got hurt. Up ahead, the cops saw an opportunity. The road narrowed as it approached a bridge over the Cape Fear River, creating a natural choke point. If they could corner her there, she would have nowhere to go. It was a risky plan, but it was their best shot. But Desiree was quick to realize what they were trying to do. She swerved wildly, trying to shake them, but Glass stayed right on her, refusing to give her an inch of space. Just as they reached the entrance to the bridge, Glass made his move. He swerved the sedan to the left, pulling alongside the Impala and forcing her toward the guardrail. Desiree tried to cut to the right, but Wright had already anticipated the move. He reached over and yanked the handbrake, sending the sedan into a controlled slide that blocked the entire road. The Impala had nowhere to go. Desiree slammed on the brakes, and the car skidded to a halt just inches from the edge of the bridge. For a moment, everything was still, and the only sound was the hiss of the Impala's overheated engine. Officers Glass and Wright didn't waste a second. They were out of the car in an instant, and this time, their guns were drawn. They began moving toward the Impala with practiced precision. Desiree was trapped, but that didn't mean she was done fighting. Hands where I can see them, Wright shouted in a firm and commanding voice. He ordered her to get out of the vehicle immediately. For a moment, Desiree hesitated as she looked at the two officers. She was cornered and out of options, but the stubbornness in her eyes hadn't faded. She slowly opened the driver's side door and stepped out unarmed. Glass kept his weapon trained on her. He was ready for anything. He ordered her to get on the ground and put her hands behind her head. But Desiree didn't comply. Instead, she gave that same cold, cunning smile she had shown right before. For a split second, Glass thought she might try something. But then, the smile faded as she realized the futility of her situation. She slowly lowered herself to the ground and placed her hands behind her head. Wright moved in quickly and secured her wrists in handcuffs. He read her her Miranda rights and told her that she was under arrest for dangerous driving and trying to kill police officers. The chase was over and Desiree Brochet, the reckless driver who had nearly taken both their lives, was finally in custody. But as the cops hauled her to her feet and led her back to the sedan, Glass couldn't shake the feeling that this was far from over. Desiree was taken to the station, where she was booked on multiple charges including felony assault with a deadly weapon on a government official, felony flee to elude arrest, careless and reckless driving, and failure to stop at a stop sign. However, despite the gravity of her situation, Desiree remained smug and uncooperative. She refused to explain the motive of her reactions or show any remorse. Instead, she sat silently in her cell and looked so unconcerned about the consequences she faced. Desiree continued this attitude when she appeared in court for her initial hearing. As she stood before Judge Stokes, she smirked and insisted that she was not guilty of the charges against her. As far as she was concerned, she was a good student who had never been in trouble before. She only went to school, kept good grades, and worked her job. She argued that she should not be in jail because of her clean record. For all she knew, the cops were setting her up. And that did not mean that she had done anything wrong. But what she did not know was that Judge Stephen Stokes was a no-nonsense judge known for his firm stance on criminal behavior. He also had very little tolerance for arrogance. He had seen many defendants, like Desiree, criminals who thought they could manipulate the system with charm or swagger. As Desiree continued to downplay the seriousness of her actions, the judge's patience wore thin. From the papers in front of him, he could see why she was so smug and arrogant. Desiree indeed had a very clean record and she had no motive. Also, she had not injured any of the officers in the incident and the gun used in the shooting was nowhere to be found. With all these facts, she believed a good lawyer would be able to convince the court to let her go. But Judge Stokes was not about to let Desiree off lightly. He decided it was time to teach her a lesson in humility. So he did something that instantly made her regret her actions. 
He ordered that her bond be raised from $25,000 to $100,000. Desiree was so shocked that her mouth fell wide open. $25,000 was high enough, but $100,000 was a sum far beyond what she could afford. The smirk on her face disappeared instantly as the reality of her situation set in. As she was escorted back to police custody, her behavior was now fearful. The weight of her crimes was beginning to sink in, and she realized that her actions had far more serious consequences than she had anticipated. Despite her initial confidence, Desiree's situation grew increasingly worse as the investigation progressed. Spent shells were found in the car she had been driving, confirming that she had indeed fired at the officers. There were multiple witnesses, including the diner patrons, who saw her attempt to run glass over with her car. The firearm itself was discovered in a drainage ditch where Desiree had attempted to hide it during her flight from the police. Her fingerprints were all over the weapon which further implicated her in the shooting. To make matters worse, the investigation revealed that both the car and the gun had been stolen by Desiree, and the reason behind her actions was exposed. Desiree's boyfriend had recently broken up with her and she was heading to confront him. In a fit of rage and desperation, she had stolen a car and a gun and began to drive to his workplace. Desiree would have gotten to her ex-boyfriend and harmed him if she hadn't run into the cops. She had not only put the lives of two police officers at risk, but had the intent to commit even more serious crimes. As the evidence against her mounted, Desiree found it increasingly difficult to defend herself. Her previous reputation as a hard-working student meant little in the face of the overwhelming proof of her guilt. She had endangered lives, committed multiple felonies, and shown no remorse for her actions. The community was appalled by Desiree's behavior, but they also hailed Officers Glass and Wright as heroes. Their quick thinking and bravery had prevented a tragic outcome, and they were commended for their actions. Both officers received bonuses and promotions that recognized their dedication to duty under extreme circumstances. Wright could now breathe free, knowing his upcoming family needs would be covered by the bonuses. Desiree, on the other hand, faced the full weight of the law. Her trial was swift, and the jury had little difficulty in finding her guilty on all charges. Judge Stokes was true to his reputation and he handed down a harsh and long sentence, ensuring that she would have plenty of time to reflect on the consequences of her actions. In the end, Desiree's smirk had been replaced by regret and fear. The young woman who had once thought she could outsmart the system now faced a long prison sentence and an uncertain future. Her case serves as a reminder that no one is above the law. Reckless behavior, especially when it endangers others, will be met with the full force of justice. What do you think about the judge's verdict? Share your thoughts in the comments section. Thank you for watching. See you in the next video.